Um, hello, and welcome to our talk on the DIV file format and how it can help accelerate software development. I'm Ida, and I'm a product manager from AWS Developer Tools, and this is Mario. Yes, I'm uh, Mario Loriedo, uh, and I'm a developer and a senior uh, principal software engineer uh, working from, for uh, Red Hat, and uh, I'm Italian, and based in France, and yeah and uh, work on developer tools at Red Hat. And both Mario and I, we are part of the open standard dev file community. Uh, and we are excited to be here today to introduce you to the dev file format and show you what kind of positive impact it can have on the daily workflow of developers, making them much more productive. So at the core, the, the ethos of the dev file format is that it should be an automated process to be up and running in a development environment. It should be an, sort of an on-demand, immediate experience to be um, in an environment so you can dive straight into um, writing, testing, and debugging code. Uh, unfortunately, this is not really the reality that we have today. Um, it's become very normal for the application to be cloud-native, but we still have developers sort of left behind um, working on local static compute. They have severe configuration overhead and daily upkeeping of their development environment. So what we, of course, want to do is also look at the other problems that we have when it comes to local development environments. So all this, the, the tooling that you need to contribute to a project, uh, they're version specific to, uh, to a project. So this effort of getting set up is not just a one-time experience. Uh, every time you want to switch to a new project, you are again stuck with this manual setup. And even when you have the best of intentions, um, the configuration of your environment starts to diverge between uh, team members. And this inconsistency that you have among team members makes it even harder to collaborate on a project. F code really shouldn't behave different depending on which developer picks up the code. But still today, we hear this sort of old phrase of it works on my machine way too often. Also, with the dev file, we have a chance to modernize the way the developers work. Um, it's, um, it's possible to take the classic benefits of the cloud of speed and automation and apply them to development environments. So when vendors of remote cloud development environments choose to use the dev file as their sort of format for the configuration file, they are able to give uh, developers environments with the click of a button. And since we now have the environments living remotely in the cloud, it's also possible to, to never slow developers down because it's possible to, to easily scale the compute and memory um, of whatever action that's compute intensive that goes on in the development environment. So this means that all these problems, we have um, a, a solution to it by the dev file format. Yeah, so the, um, we have see, seen those, those problems. Uh, if you have been developing, you, I, I think you're used to, uh, those are frustrating parts of our work. So uh, we've been thinking about how to make it uh, easier and identify some way to uh, solve those problems. And uh, the main idea is to make development environment as code, so to define them uh, with, uh, to define them with a source code file that can be uh, versioned on your, with, with your uh, project. So, and the idea is that we need to make them uh, re repeatable. So, the development environment needs to be repeatable through automation rather than uh, uh, configured manually and uh, error prone. Uh, they should be short lived and purpose built. So, you, you don't need to. Uh, continue updating your, your development environment, you just can, uh, continue, you can just start a new one when you need to switch to a new branch or to, to a new project. You don't need to uh, use Git or um, try to install uh, some dependencies of your new project or your new branch that will conflict with the uh, old dependencies that you had uh, installed locally. And the third thing is, so what Ida also introduced is, um, Development environment should be scalable. Sometimes you need more memory that your laptop has or, uh, or, or more CPU. With your laptop, it's hard to scale, so you, you, you need to buy a new one or to buy more RAM. On the cloud, it's 
much easier. Uh, you can you can uh, scale with, uh, with with a few click. So this is to introduce um, the dev file. So the dev file is a file format, so a YAML file that is supposed to uh, live with your source code. Uh, this is a, an example of a dev file used for uh, Go development. It's a really a simple one, the simplest dev file that you can have. Just have a, uh, an image that is referenced is the default image for Go. Uh, and it's in the, you can find it in the, in the source code at the root, call it .dev file, YAML. So, so this is the, the convention that uh, we are, we are using. But the, the .dev file uh, specification um, has more fields, much more fields. Um, so the, the first one is the version API, is the schema version. So it's possible to, since we are making evolve the spec, we want that every instance of a dev file uh, specify exactly what version of the spec it refers to. Second part are components. So it's probably the main part of the dev file. Components are um, mostly containers. Uh, there are other kinds of, uh, of components, but <clears throat> the, the, the main one are, are containers. So it's a matter, so you can define, you can specify the image, but you can specify also the, the entry point of the container or the CPU memory that it requires. So everything that you would like to specify when you run your, um, your development tools in, uh, in the cloud. Uh, third section are commands. So commands are um, usual uh, command line that you run to build or to test your application so that uh, people don't need to figure that out and uh, do that manually. If, you're, if the dev file is used by an ID, the ID can automatically have the command uh, from the UI, so you will be able to use it. So these are like the command to build to, uh, so that are used by the developers uh, for that given project. And then the last one are uh, events. So in the life cycle of your development environment, when the development environment is starting, you may want to start prefetching some dependencies or do a pre-build of your uh, of your application. Uh, so uh, th this is what the events are. So and we have post-start, pre-start events, uh, and also for uh, the end of the life cycle. This is it for the spec. And yeah. And then to get more acquainted with what the dev file is, we created in the community this gallery of, um, of sample dev files that are curated for specific languages or frameworks. Uh, this is a great way to get started with the dev file, to get acquainted with it. You can use them as is, or you can use them as a starting point or a baseline uh, that you can then further customize so it fits your specific project. But this is a great resource to, to get started and get familiar with what a dev file is. And with that, I think we're going to head over uh, to a demo uh, that Mar is going to do uh, using this uh, sample application called the Sock Shop. Yes. <clears throat> so we are we, we took as an example um, a microservice uh, application that has multiple services, and what uh, we would like to show is a dev file that allow you to do development of one of the services here. And we, we choose the front end uh, service. So um, this is the WeWork microservices demo. We haven't invented anything about that. We have just added the dev file to the repo so the, 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 we could use it uh, to start to provision and a an, uh, development environment in the cloud. So this is, uh, this is the, the organization with uh, all the repositories. And there is the front end one uh, that I fork uh, and where I actually added a dev file here. And not only I have added a dev file, but also added in the README uh, this link that allow me to start a development environment from with a click here. So let's just open it. All right, so that will start, um, it will provision the containers that are described in a dev file, um, they, they will be started in the cloud. And um, we, will, we can see, here is actually a, a 
a dashboard. Let me make it a bit, bit bigger. This is it's running on uh, on Kubernetes. This is OpenShift, so over that uh, distribution of uh, of Kubernetes, and this is actually the um, the pod where the development environment is running. So now it's it's say that it's running. So if I go back uh, to my IDE, I can see that. All right, so it's uh, it has been created, so it's been, been started. So I have uh, Visual Studio Code running in my in my browser. Uh, we have, uh, let me just show you a little bit bigger. So this is uh, so just plain vanilla uh, Visual Studio Code. It's um, it's running in the browser, but it's exactly the same source code of Visual Studio Code. We're just repackaging it and running it in a, in a container. We have some, uh, so we usually uh, continuously rebased it. But the, the, the editor, so the, we'll see that later, is, is not defined in the dev file. The dev file is really decoupled uh, from, from the, the editor that will, will run. The important thing is that you need somehow to connect to that, uh, to that development environment. And Visual Studio Code, in this case, is the way to connect uh, to the pod and containers where I actually have my uh, build tools. So if we go back, so if I, I've, I've cloned here um, the source code of the front end, and uh, there is a dev file, so the dev file is here. You can see that uh, it has a one component for, for the front end. Uh, it's, uh, it's a container with, uh, that is related to the, is actually the microservices demo front end that is based on the Docker file dev that I've, that I've here. So it has a, a Node.js, so I will be able to actually start the front end uh, from the command line. Uh, something else that I wanted to show is, um, yeah, the source code, I can just open uh, this JavaScript file and uh, I, I can show that some, since, so here the, it's Visual Studio Code, so there is the, the TypeScript uh, extension that is uh, already included, so I don't have to install anything here. Um, but I have, so I will have, I have uh, code completion if I do that and I can. So I can. So this is classical thing for for IDEs. You you also have um, you are able to see like documentation or uh, the definition. I can navigate to the definition of the code, etc. So it's really Visual Studio Code, but running in your uh, browser tab. And you, I, I didn't have to install anything locally. Didn't have to install Visual Studio Code. Didn't have to install uh, Node.js. And I was able to uh, to have that uh, on the fly. Uh, other thing that I wanted to show is that once you, so not only you have the code, but you are also able to run. So you have you have a container with Node.js. So and I have uh, um, the definition of the command in my source code. So is, there is a command that is used for debugging the application that is defined. So I can just click here, and it starts uh, it starts my Node.js application. And once the, the Node.js application is started, actually the, there is an extension that see that there is a process uh, that is listening on this port, and this process is this port is a port that I had defined in my dev file. So when you see the process, it's asking me if I want to to uh, open the uh, application on a new tab. So, and this is so our example application, our microservice application that I've, I'm able to, uh, to run from my browser uh, through the dev file definition. Uh, and let's make it shorter. So an, another cool thing is that you, you can, for example, if I go back to the, my catalog and I, I can put breakpoints here. So if I go back to the application, I click on catalog, and I see here there is a this red dot. That means that the breakpoint has been hit, and so I'm able. Uh, so the application has stopped here; is not running, and I can see the value of my variables. Uh, I can uh, add add variables to, to watch, to, and also um, I should be able to actually have. Uh, 
So for more complicated variables, I can really navigate from the ID. Uh, so this is classical Visual Studio Code anyway, but it's cool to be able to do that without installing anything locally and, we, and uh, running it in the browser. Uh, so I can continue the execution. And I think that's uh, basically it from uh, development life cycle. So we, the other thing is that, um, yeah, you, you, you get, uh, extensions that can be installed with so with, with one click, uh, so they, they 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 get installed and you're you're able to have uh, uh, extensions all the extensions that are published on uh, OpenVSX. So we're not we are not able to use the Microsoft uh, Marketplace, the so called Marketplace, uh, but there is an OpenVSX um, that is a open marketplace that is we are able to use. So we are able to connect to that. Uh, there is also a source code. So I've alre I'm already logged in to GitHub uh, with my credentials. So I haven't seen that. But the first time that you start a workspace, you are asked to um, authenticate with GitHub. So I'm able to commit with my, uh, with my user. And uh, yeah, I think that's basically for, for, from the demo point of view. And I think typically with automation, like the cool stuff is all the stuff you don't see. So this was truly just a click of a button and then a bunch of stuff uh, goes on in the background and that's just been offloaded to somebody else to handle. Um, so you just get that immediate experience where you're up and running uh, and ready to code. And you, by having this dev file placed in the repo, as a team, you start to collaborate on a single source of truth. So anybody who creates a branch to start contributing with fixing a bug or uh, developing a new feature, they are truly now working in copies of the same environments. So they can have this sort of sense that, that they're not um, sort of diverging and going off in, in different directions for, for what they're working on and how they're all contributing to the same application and bringing customer value to their end users. Okay, so now we have seen we have seen the dev file, we have seen the demo. We want to uh, talk about how does do we translate this dev file into a development environment in the cloud. Uh, so what I've just shown is um, on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is is a platform, and we use uh, something that is called the Dev Workspace operator. So it's a Kubernetes operator uh, that uh, provision development environment. And I have, uh, I have another talk later today uh, just about the, the dev workspace operator, so I won't talk too much, but the idea is from the dev file, the dev workspace operator creates a workspace pod, so a pod with uh, containers and services that will allow a developer to connect uh, from their browser and to just code uh, build and test their application, so the, the, the inner loop. But that's not the only, only um, platform they support, uh, supported. There is also uh, Docker, so there is a, a plugin for Docker that allows to transform a dev file, to, to, to transform it to provision a development environment in, um, in a, a VM that only has Docker. Uh, installed, so uh, no need to have Kubernetes in this case. And uh, that's something that uh, EDA's team has been uh, working on. And But the result is, is the same. You will have the same containers that will be started and you will, the developer will be able to access uh, from their browser or from uh, their local uh, Visual Studio code that can connect remotely or um, IntelliJ uh, local IntelliJ can connect remotely to the to the container to use the power and the tools repeatable uh, containers that are in that where the the development tools are are running. So and that so it comes to the uh, ID supports. Yeah. So what's what's nice about um, having these cloud development environments is that we are taking the, the traditional IDE that's a desktop and a little bit of a monolith, and we're splitting it into two. So you have the remote backend up in the cloud, um, and then you can sort of reduce your IDE to be um, 
a thin client that can run in the browser or still on your desktop and connect to this remote environment. Um, and when you start working in the developer space, you quickly realize how passionate developers are about their favorite IDE and their preferred IDE. Um, so at least for me, this is a great example of how we can sort of uh, respect and meet developers where they are. If they've been coding in IntelliJ or a PyCharm or VS Code for the last 10 years, and that's their comfort zone, they can keep that experience, but really enhance and modernize it by, um, by sort of offloading the, the sort of heavy lifting of the environment uh, to the cloud.